but we can discuss the items without coming to a decision or any sort of debate. Um, so we're not going to do notes, but if you have a minute, sorry, if you have edits or comments on the minutes, just please send them directly to staff so that they can um, consider those uh, before our next meeting. Um, and on that, I guess, Davey, you can give us a financial update unless you want to just do that all in the budget conversation. Yeah. Okay. You know, we're in that. Do I hear somebody coming? We're in that Oh, okay. So then, um, let's do let's do the budget request. This is the nice, meaty discussion that cannot be full of questions or something. Let's go. Well, I was going to see about how long. I tell you what, if we could, we chair, could do the Morris Building. Yes. Let's yes. do that. Okay. Uh, we submitted. And the capital improvements budget, um, as many of you know, about three years ago, there was a move to um, purchase the Morris Office Building, which is the headquarters of the National Baptist Publishing Board, which was uh, built in uh, 1926, I believe, by the McKissick and McKissick um, Black Architectural Firm. That fell through primarily through the transition from Mayor Briley to Mayor Cooper, and that group disbanded, and uh, it has come up again. And since, as a metro agency, we submitted the capital improvements request on our budget for the purpose of the facility for the construction of a uh, African American museum and um, additional metro office space. Um, we're being moved right now. We're in a temporary position for six months, and then we will we'll move down on Second Avenue. And the cost per square foot there is thirty-nine dollars a square foot versus where we are now in Parkway. I think is eighteen or nineteen dollars. So um, many of you got the email with the op-ed piece and the uh, individuals that are in support of that. MHRC's role is no more than the uh, capital request that individuals and other organizations will make this happen. Uh, Metro Planning, if they choose to purchase the building, will make that happen. Uh, a um, group of local historians as a historical committee will make the museum happen. Our contribution to this is to request that Metro reconsider purchase of the building. What are the chances? And what do you, what's, how's the conversation going? Well, we were able to get 21 council people to sign support uh, for this. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they, they support the museum, but uh, hadn't gotten to a vote. There are two issues that will be coming up. One, doing uh, this budget process of the 4% uh, fund balance, if I'm not mistaken, where one-time expenditures can be done. Um, then there's the uh, capital improvements plan that comes up later in the summer where it can be brought up again. If it's not in this thing, I mean, sometimes these projects come up and it takes a couple of years to, for it to get into the capital budget. What's the timeline? Do we have, does it well, no, no, see, this one, because it was brought up three or four years ago, its status has never changed. It has the second highest rating by the um, Planning Commission. They have a process where they take, and I may say this backwards, there's the capital improvements budget and the capital improvements plan. I believe it's the capital improvements budget that lines up all these projects and then they get rated uh, and they get rated as recommended, recommended if funding is available and then they go on down. This has the second highest rating of recommended if funding is available and that's from three, four years ago. So there was nothing to be done there other than to try to introduce it into the capital spending plan in a particular budget year. So it's very it's uh, very possible if the council agrees that um, if they approve it, it could be 
allocated in this capital improvements plan budget year. Yes. So um, are we still soliciting signatories to the letter or is that done? Well, that's done. Okay. Um, there'll be information coming out. There's a couple of groups that have put together some uh, awareness projects. One will be on June 17th and then another one on July 15th, I believe. And we'll be sending y'all all the information as it relates to there. The uh, <clears throat> Community Foundation has set up a fund there and um, um, that fund will um, pay for expenditures that are not attached to us that does not bind MHRC to anything. And there will be a group of the individuals that will um, hopefully at some point be approved by at least the executive board to set on that uh, fund. And it's to save the Morris Fund at uh, the Community Foundation. And for what it's worth, uh, is, is the Morris Building on the list of endangered buildings that's published by the Metro Historical Commission? Yes, it has been on there. Yes, and it's also um, on the um, National Historical National Register. Um, it's a facility that I believe should be saved. Uh, and uh, with all the history as Nashville changes, uh, African-American history is not always present nor prevalent. Um, short story, I remember as a kid, uh, fourth grade or whatever, going to Fort Nashboro, and you would stand up there and they would tell you how James Robinson and John Donaldson came down the Cumberland and walked across land, and you look out over and you kind of could almost see that as a kid. Nowhere that they tell me that they brought over 200 enslaved people with them. And the place where the Morris Building now stands is the last recorded place for the slave market where they bought and sold slaves right there on that corner. So I think there's a lot of history here. And I'm just hopeful that the city, the council, would think that maybe this is the time to do that. The event that Davey was talking about is on um, Juneteenth at the African American Music Museum. Um, and there's tickets on Eventbrite yeah. if you wanted to join. It's like a four hour panel discussion, all kinds of stuff. So I think we can we can come in whenever. Um, but it's worth participating in, I think. Um, I also grew up, was born and raised here and I knew nothing about the Bo Morris building until y'all told me about the Morris building. So I think the other opportunity here is for us to just spread awareness around it. Um, however that you do spread awareness because that's, I think that's a big part of like ho hopefully bringing the pressure up, but also just um, what Dave was talking about, our history that we know nothing about or are not educated in. Okay, and I saw something go up and then it went down. She's working on it. Um, did any other commissioners get this? Yeah, one sec. yeah is, is the projection working? So savethemorris.org. Um, I think we sent this in yeah, with the agenda did. and we'll send it afterward. But you can get tickets for that event on June 17th. It's coming up quickly, but all the information is sort of centralized on the website. It's like a $16 ticket. Um, and we have um, access to a number of comp tickets if you have people in your communities who you, you feel like could could make cool. it with a free ticket. So just let us know. What's the, what is the event? It's this one I was just telling you well, about. I didn't hear you. Okay, so uh, this is basically the the, f the fundraising organizations that have fun uh, arisen around this are having a four hour event uh, from. It's the keynote from 2 to 2.15. 2 2.30 to 3.15, Civil Rights and Change Legacy in Nashville. So that'll be like a panel discussion. Uh, 3.30 to 4.15, Black Opry performance. And then 5 to 6, reception. And so it's just a way to like raise money and be. And it will be where? At the African American Museum. Uh, music Museum. At the Museum for African American Music. Um, downtown. Is that sufficient information? Or one? Okay. And, I, and it was in the email that Crystal sent. 
I think we're ready for the budget. Okay, great. As we told you before, our total budget is about $734,000. And uh, we made a budget request of almost that much. And um, the only part that was approved was $12,000 for some community engagement. And so we've gone back now and pared that down to about $389,000. And the main issues that are on there are um, uh, position reclassifications are probably for me, well, they are for me the most important element of that. If um, we've done a bit of an analysis of the positions within MHRC as compared to other departments, and our department comes in quite a bit under the other departments. So we are asking for $90,000 in that respect to uh, reclassify uh, members of our staff to be uh, compatible with individuals in other departments that uh, make considerably more. We'll probably hear a little bit about how that seems to pan out and look out uh, as the inclusivics report suggests that uh, the organizations with um, administrative and legislative um, import in metro government, uh, by and large, make more than those who provide services uh, across the board. That's what the report showed. But so we're trying to get our positions reclassified. And then we're asking for three other positions. And uh, it comes down to we're asking for uh, the council to modify the budget to include 389000 Don't know whether we get any of that or not. <laughs> But uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, historically, I say this every opportunity I get, historically MHRC has been underfunded comparable to what our job, our um, um, charter mandated job is compared to other metro departments. Uh, and I think that that is not by accident. So uh, I read that uh, with respect to the COB, one of the proposals on the table is to transfer that over to MHRC. I am not aware. I read it in, 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 in a newspaper. I have not, I'm not aware, yeah. nor have I been in any yeah. conversations where that was the subject of the conversation. Okay. Uh, MHRC is not <laughs> equipped Mm -hmm. nor set up to take over the civilian oversight board. Watch out. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember right now. Uh, in fact, the council passed, I believe, a resolution, and I think the administration supported it, guaranteeing that irrespective of if the, the COB law that passed did pass, that they would maintain their funding for this coming up calendar year. Um, and that's, yeah, um, yeah, we, we got the COB on there and you kind of jumped over in that. Uh, do we keep going with that or what? Well, can, can I ask a budget question before we move? Yes. Um, I think you said this, and I'm really loud right now. Let me see how to make this. Um, I think you said this, but what would be, the bare minimum that you need? I mean, I know what they've given you, but what would be the bare minimum at least to do those staff adjustments? 90, is that what you said? Yes, 90 for the staff adjustments. Okay. Because uh, again, um, without the people to do the job, even the strategic plan that we're putting together, and even as we talk about what all of that looks like, uh, and then having to respond to immediate requests, um, you, you just don't have the bandwidth in many situations to do multiple things at the same time. In that situation where he reads something, a commissioner reads something and, and is stating that this is something that's coming to us, would that be inappropriate for you to contact a report and say, we never heard of this, or we this is not 
we're not aware of this. Um, well, I'd almost comment. want to know where did you read that at, Mr. Vinnick? And okay. So on that, I think we're moving on to the COB conversation. As if, if anybody has any more questions around budget, we'll move on. Okay, great. Then let's do it. And to go to your lights on, I don't know if it's meaning to be. Oh, this is just in case I had something <laughs> spontaneously. <laughs> Yes, we're going to start with Ashley, and then uh, I'll come behind her. <clears throat> well, so um, we didn't get this um, in advance for sending it out with the agenda, but what you have in your agenda packet is a one-pager that's being distributed to organizations, agencies, other departments um, that want to be aware of, support what the current Community Oversight Board um, is asking for support around. And so this one pager sort of outlines what they are hoping to see out of this, um, sort of where we are right now. And so I, th I think it was already mentioned, you know, the council has to make some decisions, um, has to pass something to maintain some sort of an entity, um, some sort of a department. And so the four things that they want to see in that are listed here. Um, number one, ensuring that the composition of the board is appointed from majority community organizations or nominated by council members. Number two, preserve its ability to request subpoenas from the Metro Council. Number three, like Davey said, ensure that the minimum budget and staff is maintained through the future year ahead of us. And number four is about making sure that um, board members have enough time to complete the required Citizens Police Academy course. Um, so this is sort of the, the messaging of what the current staff and board um, are hoping to get out of this. Um, and then you can add more. And then the council has placed uh, council member Syracuse uh, and their committee in charge of um, creating what this ordinance will look like. Uh, apparently there's been a couple versions that are still going around. The dates are the law doesn't take effect until July 1. And after July 1, there's 120 days to comply. So it may not come up at all during the month of June. But um, as this goes along, I think not only should the commission, uh, but others should be paying attention to this undoing of the will of the people and sending a process back to the department and the exact same individuals that the city offered a resounding vote of no confidence in. So this is a, a disturbing um, occurrence that not only are is the COB currently working on it, but others in and out of Metro community groups and orgs um, all have got their eyes on this situation of trying to make sure that the best possible alternative comes out of this. The state law takes away um, access to materials that anybody from the public would not be able to get. It takes away the ability of the COB to do investigations. It takes away their access to crime scenes. Uh, it takes away their access to issue subpoenas. So those are, in my opinion, the major issues that change the scope of what the COB is now and what it will become after that. So by this number two, are they trying to use a different method to subpoena yes the council that, has an ability to yes subpoena. and the council would issue um subpoenas on behalf of the clb Oof. and then um it seems like number one needs to be defined further and i'm sure that that they're going to do that because one council member could nominate 10 of their well the state law and all that's going to be worked out on some other level because the state law says that the mayor will appoint them and it also lists some restrictions 
to the individuals that are selected that was in the COB. Uh, it expressly says that there can't be any consideration for a selection of a board member based on race, demographics, uh, income, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, um, so that's something that's got to be worked out. But the law does not give anybody else uh, appointing authority other than the mayor. So to your to your knowledge, uh, is the opinion of Metro Legal Council that the allocation out of Metro budget at two point something million dollars goes away or does that remain? No, no, it remains. Uh, there's already something on the books that says that at least for this year, that they said this even before the law passed, mm -hmm. that they passed a resolution, I believe, that say that uh, they will uh, keep the budget at least through this year. Mm -hmm. And so what's being asked for with the establishment of what this new process will look like, absent the COB, mm -hmm. is the budgetary process. Right. But this year, yes, they will be funded. Well, but it, I, I guess is the, is the opinion of legal counsel, to your knowledge, that in subsequent years that allocation goes away? Or is that, because I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an allocation by virtue of shorter amendment. Well, that question I couldn't answer, and I think that'd be something that would have to be answered directly by Metro Legal. Uh, but um, what I know at this point is that, at least for this year, mm -hmm. the budget is in place. Yeah. I've got two quick questions, if you have time. Um, does it change the, um, the, the size of the uh, COB at all? And then um, if it's getting reestablished, does it um, interrupt or interfere with the current terms that are being served? Oh, yes. All the, let me go backwards. Those terms mean nothing come July the 1st. Uh, and, yes, the size is being reduced from 11 down to 7, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Any um, lawsuits planned? Um, Metro Legal passed on the opportunity to sue. Uh, from what I can ascertain from various community members and groups, that uh, that is still conversation that individuals are having. Um, personally, um, I find it hard to believe that this is something that hadn't been sued for already. I mean, the success with a lot of legislation that came out of the legislative session of things being overturned is really high, so this is worth pursuing. <laughs> Oh, and as I, I, I know of individuals and groups that are actively seeking, yeah. pursuing okay. some type of that. Yeah, because just in fact, the federal court um, overturned the LGBTQ bill out of Memphis uh, Friday night, right after midnight. Okay. I think that seems like the best. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, as sort of instructed by this, even if you think your council person already supports the COB, I mean, according to this, you know, like, make that heard. Um, everybody wants to be doing the right thing right now in election season. Everyone's very responsive. Um, I think, you know, continuing to voice that the legislative session is over, but like, we still need to figure out how to respond to the damage that's been imposed on us and what are we doing about this. So really making sure that um, these things and whatever they can get in that ordinance get put in. Is there any concern around that? Like council members for and against yet? I'm, I, I'm not sure, um, but I mean, I, I think like continuing to ask like is there going to be litigation i mean it it helps to you know like you said this is going against the votes of you know the, over one hundred thirty thousand people yeah. and so just like not letting this simmer out yeah yes and particularly i don't you know um often people who advocate for better policing are um tagged publicly as anti-police and I think I, I don't know what impact that may have, but it is an election year. But best practices from the national law enforcement agencies, from all academics, that it is best practice 
that police officers do not police themselves. I cannot find one qualifiable reference that as a college professor, I would let a student submit to me that adds any legitimacy to why a police department would not want oversight itself. Well, in, I'm going to uh, just as commentary, but still, I want to ask a question as well. When we see that in 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 since we've been appointed, we've had issues with this committee. I mean, this commission being in alignment or being utilized by the police department when it's to everyone's advantage to have that type of immersion and training and diversity. Um, this shouldn't be as far fetched that this would not be something that's uh, supported or oh, oh, that they would welcome as well. But I think the marginalized communities that are heavily impacted by policing should have more of this information in their hands um, to let them know what's happening. I don't uh, think that's happening. Commissioner uh, Holmes is referring to the mobile diversity tours that MHRC developed and have done for a number of years with the graduating classes of um, police officers. So that was abruptly stopped a few months ago, and um, MMPD uh, has continued to even try to use the individuals that uh, we had curated over time. And uh, they call us because uh, um, they don't pay them for what they do. And we had curated a group of people that were professionals in this. Um, we still believe strongly in MDS, and we're still working to hopefully that that will get restored. Um, Again, you can't do this work without somebody getting upset at some point. And apparently, um, with the current structure, um, individuals were upset at being challenged around what the status quo is. Has it been reported as to how this got to the legislature? No. No, other than the normal tales that are told right. about bathrooms and water fountains. Yeah. That's another probably important story. Okay. Then I think we can move on to inclusivics. This is me. Um, so we don't have too much new to share. We're continuing with the community engagement, sort of gallery, poster board sessions that we've been doing. We have completed five of them in different locations around the city, and we have three more um, coming up today at the Madison Community Center, next Monday at the McCabe Park Community Center, and June the 21st at the Shelby Community Center, and so, um, and we've also presented at the IMF. Um, we were able to have a conversation on an episode of This Is Nashville last week, and so we're looking, you know, if, if you have any sort of, I'm calling them like captive audiences, places where we can put our display boards up, like you saw at the library last month, um, we'll, we'll be doing that through July, I think, is probably the cap that we're putting on it. And so um, one of the benefits of doing them at community centers is that we've been able to talk to employees. Um, you know, these are places that are staffed by the um, employees that the report is about. And so we've had good conversations. Um, some employees talked about how they wish that they had access to Spanish classes because a lot of people who come through the door they can't really effectively communicate with or just like have those introductory conversations. Um, I had a conversation just last week at Southeast Center with a former employee who 
left on bad terms and has a pending um, racial discrimination case. And so we're having really relevant conversations by bringing this sort of on the road and taking it around. And so we definitely think that they're worth doing and are glad um, that we've got a few more coming up. Um, what else would we add? Well, I think it's been well received. Um, it's even showing up in some of the um, I believe comments around that some of the candidates are making and even hearing some equity based questions that come up to candidates in some of the forms. Uh, so we disseminated it to all the departments, heads, to all council, to the mayor's office. So uh, we sent hard copies to everybody. And uh, I think it's again, as I said before, I think it's a great document that. Um, just gives a unbiased look at where we are and uh, if everything is based on data so what are the policies that will impact this data in a positive way to create a more just and equitable metro um i forgot but did we make an assumption that's or did we know that of that, that data piece that's about um of a certain um salary point they are outside of nashville um and whether that was williamson county and if so would it be relevant to have an event out in williamson county to inform those people well i don't know if it's just williamson county uh i'll defer to ashley but it's all the surrounding counties it's about 50 percent of the ten thousand people that work for metro don't live in metro yes was that an assumption that I'm I made? I'm going to do a little math for you. I got to run it. Okay. I know what you're asking. Because it feels like that's an important thing for them to know. Um, and then do you think like the head of Mac could bring this up in a conversation when they're talking about, you know, their employee salaries and stuff like that? I mean, Mac's fully funded, but those are the places I think that have the high number of social workers that are paid that lower rate. Like this could be a conversation with HR and with mayor's office, et cetera, moving in the next year. Well, I think the data is the data. And again, we provided it to all the departments. Uh, we hope it's a useful tool when you're looking at policy decisions, particularly around DEI related stuff. Uh, and then it also allows just the ability for inquisitive leaders to ask questions. Why is this this way? Why is that this way? Yeah, I would say the um, hard copies, we just sent them out to department heads, um, like right now, essentially. And so, you know, included in the cover letter is an offer if you'd like to dig into data for your department, like let's have a phone call, let's talk about what might be helpful. Because I mean, this is happening within the context of the public hearing on the budget tomorrow. We know that there's various um, places as you know, asking for investments and in budgets, um, talking about what kind of how do we treat our employees when it comes to like step raises and equity in how those adjustments are made it made made it um so we're, we're hoping to yeah i mean we're not going to probably impact the budget in a big way right now because we know that it's already mostly fully baked when it comes to us but especially for next year and the opportunities that i think knowing that we're going to have a new mayoral administration and we have been involved with <clears throat> various uh department heads inside of Metro, just having just general conversations about inclusivics. And we're looking at other opportunities to look at other stuff, such as retention, promotion, um, um, the way um, offboarding is done and the reasons why, uh, maybe to answer some of the questions that show up in the data. question um do you think um like they did with the c the oversight committees do you think that there's that this commission could also be targeted in the next year to to disband it i i, I don't know other than to say historically it has been uh defunded before okay Does 
Is that? Yeah, the answer. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, can it can it be like dechartered, unchartered, or changed? I think probably no. That's harder. I don't know than the COB because the COB came about from a referendum, but it can certainly be defunded and had been in the '90s, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. for a couple years? So just made impotent. Um, and again, I would say that that's why it's uh, budget is at the size it is and why it stays the way it is that um, um, I think budgets speak to commitments and um, they're commitment documents. And it would be a great question to ask at a mayoral debate. <laughs> For anyone holding those. <laughs> um, okay, anything else? We can't really decide anything or adjourn, but um, there is, I see that the only other thing is like executive committee meeting, just in, we're gonna have one. And all, as usual, everyone's invited to come. Uh, so yes, please do. And that'll be here, right? No, I mean at, our, at your office. Yes, it'll be at our office. At Parkway Towers. And uh, again, it's for everybody to come. Um, we're trying to, uh, wrap up this strategic plan. So uh, it's open to everybody. That was a nice conversation. <laughs> I'm not going to call it a meeting because if Derek was here, I think I'd be in trouble already. <laughs> um, but thank you for coming. And well, you got public comment, and also... you do. You do have a member oh. of the public here. Oh, okay. I guess there are. <laughs> okay. He even pulled the seat up in front of him for his feet. You got something you want to say? You got something you want to say? Okay, so he's passing on the public comment. Uh, I, I do have, I have one thing Great. I wanted to Thank say. Great, thank you, Dakota. Um, yesterday we lost a public servant, um, uh, Democratic State House Representative Bill Beck passed away yesterday. And so I just wanted to say, um, said that he was a very kind man, um, he was a great legislator, and he was a friend of mine. So I just didn't want us to leave today without recognizing his public service and his uh, dedication to our community. Yes, thank you for that. That's a big loss for, our, for Nashville, for sure, and our state. Yes. And um, for our conversation before the meeting, uh, what might we do to... Uh, have more members attend. Here we are again. Um, it's summer. <laughs> um, what we might do is, uh, I cannot do this, but we could send it out in the morning of, I don't know when you sent this out, Crystal. Was it this morning? Yeah. Right. So that can happen. I remember we we're allowed to message around meetings and just say, can you come to a meeting? So I might be able to do that. Um, but also, I think that the other conversation is like, how many meetings are we allowed to miss as commissioners? So just to remind everyone that you're really only supposed to, you can't miss two back to back, I believe, and or two out of a year or something like that. So maybe we can be reminded of the rules again. Would that be okay, staff? Um, just I, I don't know if this will work for this group, but um, I'm in an organization and we have um, a group me. It's a chat, it's, a, it's an app, and we use it to communicate because it's easier sometimes than email. I don't know if that's another place we could use to remind people or not. The sun shines, sunset, sun always rises. Laws will not allow us to be that effective or efficient. So no, the only thing that can happen is they can send you a text, but I don't want to make them do that because that's a lot of texting. But the rest of us, I mean, I do remember Derek said, if it's around, like, are you attending a meeting? Are you not attending a meeting? That's not that's okay, right? You don't know. I mean, you can't deliberate towards a decision. Right, but if I text Brent and it's like, the meeting is at this time, will you attend? I would be okay, you don't know. 
Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so then I just sent him a text and be like, did you know there's there's a meeting today? Can we just make RSVPs mandatory and then plan accordingly? Mandatory how? How do you, how do you... just just to re... Just ask for the RSVP. I mean, it's pretty. Please respond. Uh, like, say yes or no. Click the button. Click the button. Two buttons. Chris, so you want to say click the button? Okay, great. Would in you, like all you, caps you know, let, and red. Let, you know, let Davey send out. Somebody just send out a kind of slap on the this wrist. This is important. Of, this is important. Yeah. So we can plan accordingly. And Madam Chair, if I could just say, I know everybody's busy and this is a volunteer thing, but having said on both sides of it, um, I knew when the meetings were, and I couldn't make all the meetings, um, but I knew when the meetings were, and it's my hope that the effectiveness of the commission is not having 17 commissioners, but it's having 17 commissioners that are invested in what the mission of the commission is. And so, um, Respectfully, um, I mean, council knows when council is. School board knows when school board is. Fair board knows when fair board is. I mean, uh, and again, I'm not saying anything of any individual because you can't make them all and stuff happens. But when the, the commissioners are committed to the work, it makes our life a lot easier. And to that point, even just knowing in advance whether they had a quorum or not would be really helpful. Now we had three that did say that they would not be here today. Yeah, that's appreciated. Um, heard, executive director. So basically, let's not babysit ourselves or each other. Let's just be commissioners committed to the mission and show up or and or inform staff when we can because then we would know and then we could maybe postpone or something like that right okay all right then bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs>